Good morning and welcome to Legacy Baptist Church. So glad that you're able to join us today and uh, be with, your, with us to worship the Lord together. And this morning as we begin our service, I'm going to ask Brother uh, Jaff to come and he's going to read from uh, Psalms 113 for us this morning. Brother Jaff. In Psalms chapter 113 verses 1 through 5, the Bible says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun unto the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God who dwelleth on high? And as we think on these things, let's remember throughout not only today but throughout the rest of our week to always praise the name of the Lord. And let's pray together this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you just for this opportunity we have to be here, Lord, to worship you openly and freely, Lord, without fearing um, any type of persecution, Lord. I thank you so much for this week, for um, for the VBS that for the VBS that took place, Lord. I pray that uh, it impacted the lives of not only the children but also uh, also the family, the parents, and in this community, Lord. I pray that we'll continue to be a light. For your name's sake, and I pray that we'll see uh, much fruit come out of that. I pray that as we go about our day today, that we will praise you and worship you as you well deserve. I pray that you bless us for our day. Please keep us all safe here. Please bless the barbecue. I pray that uh, I pray that the weather will be well. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Let's all stand up, please, and let's sing glory. No, not glory to his name, but victory in Jesus. Very mix. Or on the first verse together. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. And he plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. On this next. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again, and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood on the last. I heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. How about the angels singing and the old redemption story? And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing standing for our next hymn as we sing when we all get to heaven when we all get to heaven <clears throat> all right on to first now sing the wondrous love of jesus sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sign. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toys of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, 
Jesus will sing and shout the victory on the last now. Onward to the prize before us, soon this beauty will be home. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. That is great singing this morning and uh, just looking at our calendar for the month. And, uh, you know, just like that, we're halfway July. Isn't that amazing how quickly uh, things go in the summertime? Uh, but we had such a great week this past uh, week here at church. We had a vacation Bible school uh, running from Monday to uh, Friday. And we just had a great crowd from the Monday to the Friday. I think we had an average of a minimum of 30 every day. Uh, but just being able to connect with the kids, being able to connect with the parents, it was just such a great week. And we have invited all the families to come back for our 11 o'clock service barbecue, so just be in prayer uh, for that service. Uh, so we do hope that you'll join us for 11 o'clock, be here. Uh, uh, we're going to be giving out tickets for the barbecue, so there'll be hot dogs and hamburgers. And the way we're going to do it today is everyone's going to be able to get one hot dog and hamburger to start. Uh, so we'll be handing those out, and then as the barbecue goes, we'll uh, be able to give more. But uh, we hope that you'll stick around for that. You can head over to the East Wing. Uh, for the cafe uh, in the more, right after and this fellowship and then at 11 o'clock we will start the service but at 11 o'clock it's going to be a special service it's going to be a recap of the week uh, so like I said we've invited a lot of the kids and the parents to come back uh, so we're looking forward to the kids singing for us at the time and I'll just be doing a review of what was taught throughout the week so you just get an idea of, of what uh, you can pray for and how the week went uh, but I just want to say thank you to the church and I'll say it again at 11 o'clock to everyone who participated in the Vacation Bible School. The week was such a success, and it couldn't have been done without everyone who volunteered. So leading up to it, people who prepared for it with the decoration, the amount of hours that went in to decorating uh, the East uh, Wing just to get the theme and to get the feeling of the VBS was just absolutely amazing of how many people put the hours in. There's people who took time off. There's people who worked around their schedule. There are people that came in from a midnight shift and came straight here to serve. Uh, there's people that served in every capacity that you can imagine. There's people that st stepped up when they needed to step up, step up. I told Pasha this week, I said, there's not one person or one aspect of the VBS that I was unhappy with. It was just such an amazing week. And for that, I'm so grateful uh, for everyone who volunteered. So thank you to everyone involved uh, this past week. So I encourage you after the service, you want to head over to the East Wing and check out the decorations. We left it up like we did last year. You're going to want to go see how it looks, and uh, you'll be amazed at the amount of work that went into that. So that will be an 11 o'clock service over on that end and outside for the barbecue. And then uh, next week, just the uh, correction on the calendar, uh, next week is Lord's Supper. Uh, so if you're here next Sunday, we look forward to taking the Lord's Supper with you. And this coming Saturday, uh, just a reminder that we have our core barbecue. So that's our ministry for anyone in their uh, 30s and 40s. We are having a barbecue this Saturday that's at 2 o'clock. So there is a sign-up sheet for if you're coming. Uh, we will provide the meat, but if you would provide the sides and if you can sign up for that, that would be great. So if you have any questions about that, you can see myself or my wife about that. And then uh, later in the month, uh, True North, just a reminder of the uh, conference in Ottawa. If there's any more questions or details that you need uh, answered uh, about, you can see myself about that. And then Youth Crew as well. It's not there on the calendar, but on July 26th, there is a barbecue at Pastor's House. Uh, so if you have any questions about that or if you need any more details, you can see him about that. That is July 26th for our youth uh, crew. At this time, I'd like to ask the ushers, if you'd come forward as we prepare to take this morning's offering. And as we uh, prepare to take that, let's pray uh, for the offering this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so grateful once again to be in your house, the freedom that we have to come and worship you. And Lord, now as we worship you in the giving of our tithes and offerings this morning, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, bless the giver and bless the offering. I pray that uh, you'd use this offering as we seek to, um, to reach our community and also, as we support worldwide evangelism, Lord, I pray that you'd bless our ministries 
uh, all the missionaries that we support this morning, those who are serving uh, even now or later uh, in, in different time zones. Lord, I pray that you bless our missionaries. And Lord, I pray that you just bless our church as we uh, continue to uh, do efforts like Vacation Bible School. And um, Lord, as we reach our community, that we'd be a beacon in this, uh, beacon in this neighborhood and that we would see uh, more people come to know you as Lord and Savior. And we pray these things in your son's holy and precious name. Amen. seem hard to bear. Sometimes the music of my soul grows deep. In times like these, my faith grows weak. I long to hear the Savior Sister Shirley, let's all stand up for our next hymn as we sing, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. And kids are now dismissed for Kids Church. All right, on the first verse. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy? Who through life has been my guide, heavenly peace, divine is comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whatever before me, Jesus to with all things well. For I know whatever before me, Jesus to with all things well. All the way. 
my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread. Gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter, and my soul at first may be gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, all the fullness of His love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed immortal wings its flight to realms of day, this my soul endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church family. So good to see you here on this beautiful Sunday morning. And I'm uh, looking forward to spending time with you today and enjoying the weather, the fellowship, if you can stick around for 11, is look forward to that, to the barbecue, uh, and I do appreciate you being here, and I'm glad for those who follow us online or watch this morning, uh, take your Bibles and turn over to Acts chapter number 9, Acts chapter number 9, and before I get into messages, there are a couple things, a couple prayer requests, uh, first of all, uh, there's, there's no cafe today, so don't go downstairs looking for coffee, or if you do, you'll be greatly disappointed, go upstairs and see job uh, they did with the decorations and things. I know you'll be encouraged. I'll bring a smile to your face, and you probably wish that you were at Vacation Bible School this week, all right? Uh, so no cafe, so just rem uh, remember that. Uh, and then uh, in prayer requests, uh, let's be in prayer for the United States and the events of yesterday, and just pray for peace. Uh, and uh, I know we don't live in the States, but they greatly affect us, so Let's be in prayer for them, and then uh, just be in prayer for our missionaries and our and church planters that we support, and many here in, in the north, northern hemisphere. Uh, they're having vacation Bible schools like we did this past week, and special outreaches. I know uh, the Bartleys in St. Lucia had uh, a bunch of people down there doing vacation Bible school and things, so let's be in prayer for our missionaries, church planters, uh, as they uh, endeavor to get the gospel to needy people, all right? So we'll pray for them in a moment. And then by praise, we had a fantastic vacation Bible school. I know Pastor Matt mentioned just a moment ago, uh, I didn't do very much. Maybe that was why it's so good. But at any rate, uh, it was a wonderful time. Lots of children here. And uh, I, I got to watch the children, but I got to watch our church folks just serve the Lord in a great way. And I, it blessed my heart to see that coming in. I know some were here all week. Some could only come for a day or two. Uh, and I know there was ones that were behind the scenes. I don't even know what they did. Uh, because it wasn't done in public. It was just a service to the Lord, and I appreciate that so much. And that's a praise. That's a great encouragement uh, for each and every one of us here at Legacy Baptist Church. So I want to praise the Lord for that. So let's look uh, to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for another day you've given to us. Lord, I pray that you be with our service here this morning. Lord, allow your word to penetrate our hearts and lives as it needs to. Lord, I pray for our neighbors to the south and the violence and things that we saw take place yesterday, and I pray, Lord, that you would bring peace. And, Lord, uh, guide the leaders there to do right, and Lord, as in our own land, we need leaders like that. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, encourage us uh, as we uh, support missionaries, and those missionaries are trying to reach young people, young boys and girls, and older folks alike in different countries around the world. Uh, summertime is a special time of outreach. I pray, Lord, you'll bless those efforts. Think of the Bartleys in St. Lucia. Lord, I pray you encourage them. And Lord, as they're involved with the building project as well, uh, guide their, uh, their, their plans. And Lord, keep them safe as they build. And Lord, thankful for their ministry and many other missionaries that we have. And Lord, we want to give you the honor and praise for uh, many young people coming out this week to Vacation Bible School. Thank you uh, for parents who let them come. And Lord, we hope to see some of them at 11 o'clock service. And Lord, thank you for those in our church, who served and served very well. Thank you for Pastor Matt and, uh, Lord, his willingness to lead this ministry. Lord, I pray you encourage him, bless him for all the hard work he did. Lord, I pray you bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, uh, Acts chapter number 9, verse number 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they are men or women, he might bring them bound <clears throat> unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there uh, shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why pursuest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will uh, what thou have me to do? And Jesus said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul rose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, and, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Down to verse number 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came thither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But they, uh, they laying wait was known for Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by, the ba by basket and let him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he assailed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. And they had spoken to him, and how he preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming and going out of Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians. But they went about to slay him, which, when the brethren knew, they brought him to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Verse 31, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. Our text revolves around the life, the man in, called here Saul of Tarsus. Most of us know him by the name of Paul. It will be changed later. And he was used, he got saved here, and he was mightily used by God. God used him to start churches all over the known world. Uh, he traveled thousands of miles. He preached Christ where he went, endured suffering for the cause of Christ beaten, shipwrecked, left for dead, stoned. He spent many years in Roman prisons because he faithfully preached Jesus Christ. Obviously, no one is born a Christian. Okay, so Paul was not always a Christian. He, he was lost. And before he met the Lord, Paul was known as a Saul, of, a Saul of Tarsus, and he hated Jesus Christ. He hated the gospel and the church he was a man, Saul was a man who was headed to a Christless eternity in a place called hell because he did not believe the gospel. I wonder how many people in the early church believed that Saul of Tarsus could ever get saved. I wondered how many were praying for him. If this man's story teaches us anything, and there's lots of great principles here, it's that there's hope for everyone. There's hope for everyone in the gospel. The gospel is for all men. Saul's story teaches us that there's hope for loved ones, for friends, for co-workers. Some of you have been praying for people in your life that, have, that are lost. You've been praying for them for a long time, and maybe you're starting to think there's no hope for them. You may be tempted to stop praying for them. You've reached a place of discouragement. You're doubting whether... They'll ever get saved. Saul's story should give you hope for people that you see as hopeless cases. Saul's story reminds us that God loves sinners. He loves sinners. 
He reminds us that as long as there's life, there is hope. As long as there's life, there is hope. He reminds us that even when we think nothing is happening, you're praying and you don't see anything happening, God is at work in the hearts of men and women. He never takes a day off. He's constantly there. First of all, we see, number one, the problem of the Pharisee. Like everyone else that's ever lived, Saul Tarsus had real life problems. Just like everybody here, just like everyone who's watched, just like everybody in the world. We all have problems. And we see, first of all, the Pharisee's self-righteousness. Saul of Tarsus was a very religious man. Very religious. He details his religious accomplishments in Philippians 3 and Acts chapter 26. In those verses... Paul lays out why he, the reasons why he was confident in his religion. He lived a clean life. As far as the law of God was concerned, he said he was blameless concerning the law. And that means he was free from fault or guilt, or de defect, I should say. As much as humanly possible, Saul of Tarsus kept the law of God. He loved the law, he studied it, he obeyed it, he lived it. The problem with Saul's relationship with the law was the fact that he was trusting the obedience to the law would save his soul. He was saying, I'm going to do what the law says. I'm going to obey it. I'm going to trust it. Uh, and it will save my soul. Saul believed keeping the law would buy him favor with God and that God would have to accept him and grant him salvation because he earned it because he kept the law. The problem with Saul's thinking and a whole host of people today is that that is absolutely not true. You can't earn your way to heaven. That's not possible. Impossible. And it's not because this uh, a Baptist church says it. It's because the Word of God says it. You have to know what the Word of God says to know how you can get to heaven. The truth is no one is saved by religious works. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. I'm not going to read all of it, but the words you need to know. Not of works. You don't get to heaven because of works. No one is saved by keeping the law in Romans chapter 3, verse 20. The law is designed to tell us when we're wrong. The law has no saving abilities. It just tells us that we've erred. And no one's saved by good deeds. Titus 3, 5 not by works of righteousness. So it's not our deeds. It's not me going out to the corner and buying a, a roofer. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at, over at uh, Tim Hortons getting a coffee, and this, there was a roofer there begging for some money. He had some problems. I, I gave him some money. That money is not going to do anything for me to get to heaven, amen? It's not going to do it. Now, he was thankful. What's getting me to heaven is because I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. That's how I'm getting to heaven. And I was glad that I gave that fellow some money and I gave him a track and said, hey, you need to read that. You need Jesus Christ in your heart and life. Anyone who's basing their salvation or their hope of heaven on good, doing good, or perfectly keeping the law is deceiving themselves, like Saul did. No one can keep the law. It's impossible. It's not, you can't do it. No matter how hard we try, we are always guilty of coming short of God's perfect standard. We don't become sinners when we sin. We sin because we are sinners. It's not like, oh, I'm fresh here. I don't, I'm not a sinner. And then, I, oopsie daisy. Now you're born a sinner. You're born a sinner. I'm so thankful that we got a, a bunch of babies in church. That's exciting. It's always fun to go up and give them little snuggles and all those things. But if you were going to ask the moms and dads about 2 o'clock in the morning if that little guy or little girl is a sinner, they'd be like, yeah, they're horrible sinners. No, we're born that way. That's not to say that none of our babies in our church are the most cute babies in all the world, but they're sinners. We're all born sinners. Jesus, there's only one way uh, through to Christ. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No, uh, no man comes unto the Father but by me. We're, we're born sinners. The letter B, the Pharisee's sinfulness. The Saul of Tarsus would have said that he was a holy, righteous man if, if we were to sit down with him and do an interview with him. 
In truth, Saul was a lost man, a lost sinner, and he needed a Savior. He didn't need the law. He needed Christ. He believed that his self-righteousness and his outward obedience would uh, get him in the, in the good side of the credits. And again, he was wrong. He, he, it has nothing to do with it. Saul's problem is a problem that everyone shares in our world. Everyone needs a Savior. Everyone. There is no one on this planet that doesn't need it. Everyone needs Jesus Christ. We cannot save ourselves. We are not good enough on our own to please God. Our only hope is the new birth in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's our only hope. Our only way for our sins to be forgiven is, is what Acts 16, 31 says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Thou shalt be saved. And when we do, when we call upon Him, believe on Him, we'll be saved, and we'll be made right with God. Our sins are forgiven. And, it, and it's not by our works. It's not by our works. Absolutely nothing by our works. You know all that we do is we accept it. We place our faith in Christ and accept the gift. That's it. It's by grace. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's amazing grace. It extends it to everyone. It doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, what you've done, or what you're thinking. No, it doesn't matter. Everyone, whosoever. Let us see this uh, Pharisee spite. Pharisee spite. I read the following statement this week, and I thought it was so good. All okay? right? And I got it in your notes. Religion without redemption always produces resentment. I thought that was an amazing statement. It's not original to me, okay? I'm, I'm not that smart to come up with such a good... I'm going to read it again because it's so good. Religion without redemption always produces resentment. And that was the case in Saul's life. He heard the truth, he heard the gospel, and he rejected it. He refused to believe on Jesus, and he was enraged. I mean, you got to be enraged. you got to be angry to go chasing people down and murder them because they believe in Jesus, don't you think? There's a bit of rage there. He was upset. He, he had a cruel heart. He, the sin of his heart made him a cruel man. And he hated Jesus because he claimed to be uh, God, the Messiah, the only way of salvation. He hated the gospel because the gospel claimed that Jesus died and he rose again the third day from the dead. He hated Jesus Christ. He hated the gospel. And the reason I use that strong term, because he was doing everything in his power to destroy it. I mean, Saul, Saul goes to the guys in Jerusalem like, hey, give me letters so I can go to Damascus so I can find the people who believe this way and I'll haul them back from Damascus to Jerusalem and we'll take care of them. Don't think for a moment that he did not hate the, the gospel and Jesus Christ. He hated them. And, and, and Acts, Acts 8, 1 says, uh, Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. Consenting means agreeable to uh, to be pleased with. See, uh, Stephen's death pleased Saul. What a crazy individual that he was pleased, and crazy with anger, that he was pleased to see someone die. I mean, that, that shows his heart. And in and verse 3 of the same chapter, Saul made havoc of the church, and the word havoc means to ruin, to destroy, to devastate Saul was entering into the private homes of believers and taking those believers and dragging them off into custody. And we know that he was involved with killing them as well. If you would ask Saul, Saul, are you a man of faith? You know what he would have said? I certainly am a man of faith. I am. Faith in his goodness. Faith in his self-righteousness. Faith in the law and his ability to keep it. His condition and his hatred for the gospel caused the early church to look at him and say, he's a hopeless cause. We need to get away from him. And even after he was saved, we'll look at that in just a few moments, the church wanted nothing to do with him. Stay away. Maybe some of you are praying for someone like Saul. They, 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 uh, they, they say they have faith and 
uh, but they have nothing to do with Jesus Christ and they're believing in their good works or uh, their penance or whatever to, to take care of them. We, we can tell from the Word of God that that person doesn't need to do good works. They need to get saved. That's what needs to take place. They're not hopeless causes. Keep praying for them. The Lord can save them. Uh, watch as his, his story unfolds here in, in verse number 3. The power of Saul's God. Verse number 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why pursuest thou me? Why do you do this? He's on a mission to destroy Christianity. And as he was heading to Damascus to arrest the believers, God confronts this self-righteous Pharisee. A bright light shines down, and he lies there. As he lies on the ground, the Lord speaks to him. He confronts him on what he is doing and tells him that attacking the people of God is like attacking him. And instantly, Saul's life is turned upside down. The very Christ he had denied and attacked is speaking to him and confronts him about his sin. And no one thought that Saul could be reached with the gospel. But they never counted on God. They left God out of the equation. And he awoke that dead heart and Saul accepted. In verse 5, and said, Who art thou, Lord? When the Lord speaks to Saul, he says, It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The prick, it refers to an ox goad, and so that would have been a long stick, and at the very end there was an uh, iron point, and they would use that point to drive the oxen, to spur it on when it refused to move or to obey, and that would be painful, right? I, I, I never want to get hit with one of those, uh, but it was, you know, it's, it's painful. It wouldn't kill someone, but it would be painful. It never was intent to harm the, the oxen, it was the prod him on to go forward. He was like a headstrong ox. He was a stubborn man. He had turned a deaf ear to the gospel. And every time he consented to the death of a believer, I think God pricked his heart. Every time he dragged mom and dad off away from that uh, home and there was children there or there was a group there and they were yelling and screaming the cries, I think God pricked his heart. What are you doing, Saul? When he convened councils and saw Christians killed, I believe his heart was pricked. He was hard-hearted, it seemed, and indifferent to the Lord Jesus and the gospel. But God was doing a hidden work in his life. Bit by bit, pricking his heart. God was bringing him to a place where he would humble himself, and he would confess Christ as Savior. And that's just what he did. He converted him. One moment he's riding high. Uh, let her see how God converted him. I don't know if I said uh, how God convicted him. Let her be. Let her see how God converted him. One moment he's riding high as such. The next he's lying low. And God brought him to that humble place. And, and there's no great prayer here by Saul. He just says, Lord, Lord. The Lord's work and a conviction of his heart had accomplished a purpose, and he accepts Christ as his Savior, and he's saved by grace. Again, some of you are praying for lost people and loved ones, and you're not seeing a lot take place in their hearts and lives. And maybe you say, Pastor, I've been praying for this person for 20 years, and they seem no closer. Or maybe you've been praying for them 20 years, and it seems that they're worse. They're further away from the gospel than ever before. Let me encourage you to continue to pray. Continue to do that. They might be way closer to that moment of repentance and faith than you think or think is possible because you don't know what's going on in the heart. You don't. Keep on praying for them. Don't stop lifting them up. Let us not be weary in well-doing for a due season. We shall reap if we faint not. Keep at it. That's Galatians 6, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is using the vents of life the secret work of the Holy Spirit is at work there. And the Word of God, your witness, the witness of other believers. I know there's been times in my ministry where I was not the one who planted the seed and saw that person come to Christ. I was the one 
who led that person to Christ because 20 years before, a sister or a brother planted the seed of gospel. I remember this one time, I was in uh, church planting in Newfoundland, and I got a call from a, a family in Dryden, Ontario, and they're like, we know you, and my brother uh, uh, is in the hospital in Grand Falls, Windsor. Can you drive there and witness to him one more time? We've been praying for decades for him to get saved. It's like, sure, I'll go. And that's about a two-hour drive. I drove there. I met the guy. And I said, hey, I got a call from your sister or brother, and they're really concerned for you, and they wanted me to tell you this. And I gave him the gospel. I said, will you accept this gift of salvation? And he said, yes. And he got saved. And I remember phoning that brother. Actually, I think it was a sister. Tell him what happened. And they started bawling. So happy to hear that. And they, I passed the phone over to this, the man in the hospital bed. You know, a week later, he passed away. Don't stop. As long as there's life, there's hope. Don't stop witnessing. Don't stop planting the seed of the gospel. Keep praying. Number three, the evidence of Saul's conversion. Saul meets the Lord. As a super brief encounter. It's not long. And uh, the Lord tells him. The Lord said in verse number six, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. He was born again, and Jesus tells him to go. The Lord tells him to go into Damascus. So, you know, again, some people are like, well, it doesn't seem like he really got saved here. All he said was, Lord. Is there any evidence? Oh, there's all kinds. There's all kinds. By his works. In verse 6, the Lord tells him what to do. It was a simple command, and Saul followed it to the letter. He did exactly what was told him. He went to the city, and he was there three days uh, without direction, and he obeyed the command of the Lord. The Lord sent him Ananias, and we're going to look at him, Lord willing, next week, uh, and just Focus on him for a little bit, uh, verses 10 to 19. But he obeyed the Lord. You know, when obedience to the Lord is an evidence that you are a Christian. That's an evidence by your works. I'm, uh, good works, doing what's right, obeying him. So not only by his works, but by his words. And verse number 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues uh, that he is the Son of God. As soon as he gets saved, he begins to serve the Lord. I know there's a time here when Ananias, in a few days before he receives his sight back and things, but he is after it. He is after preaching the gospel. He uses every platform he has to tell others about Jesus Christ. He told governors and kings. He told soldiers and merchants. He told commoners and poor people, all like, about Jesus. He spoke about the love and grace of the Savior everywhere he went. He spoke it. He wrote it. I understand uh, that he was used by the Holy Spirit. God used in the right portions of the, of the Bible. Uh, but he wrote it out. The gospel that he hated. He hated the gospel. The gospel that he hated became what he loved. Isn't that evidence of a transformed life? It's the work of God in his life. The, the work of the gospel became what he loved and talked about the most. Let her see by his walk. Saul abandoned the sins of self-righteousness, of hatred and murder, and embraced the new life of love for all, for all men. And it was for, through Christ. His life was changed. He was never the same again. And now, and that's because he belonged to Jesus Christ. He was a child of the King. When God saves a sinner, he produces a very... Same kind of changes. He gives them a new birth, John 3, 3. He makes them new creatures in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. The redeemed prove their salvation by what they do, what they say, how they live. And listen, the world has every right to judge us on those things because we ought to be different than the world. Amen? How dare we say, I'm a Christian and live like them in, in the workplace and things and they say, well, you don't seem any different than me. No, because I'm living like you. We need to be different. We need to live for Jesus. Man, we live in such a wicked world. It's incredibly wicked. If we will live for Christ and do what's right, we will be noticed. And we don't do it for our own sake. We do it for His sake, for His honor, for His glory. Live for Him. 
and you'll make an impact in your life, in your family's life, and those around you. Opposition to his conversion. Verses 20 to uh, 25. So he, he gets to preach, and then they were amazed. Uh, verse 21, I've read this a few times yesterday, trying to think how it, these people would talk. It, it, it's, it, they say, is not this he that destroyed them which called on his name in Jerusalem and came hither for that, that intent? that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? I mean, this, this is a totally messed up situation for them. He, he came to take them away. Now he's proclaiming the gospel. What a dramatic change in his life. He's not the same. And the Jews in, in Damascus are like, what is going on? What is happening here? It's, it's around this time period that Saul goes into Arabia in Galatians chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. This is when this takes place. Uh, Luke, uh, had he concluded it in the account, it's either between verses 21 and 22 or 22 and verse 23. So you, sometimes we read through the book of Acts and we think, okay, so this happened next and this happened next. There's a three-year gap in between those verses. It's a long time. All right, just to help us understand. So, so why Arabia? So why, why, why did he go there? The Lord instructed him to get alone with him so he might teach Saul the word. So Saul had been trained a Pharisee. He received much information and instruction by the best of scholars there in Jerusalem. But there's things that God had to clarify and correct in his thinking. And that's that reason why a setting apart, he couldn't confer with flesh and blood. He received his mandate directly from the Lord. You can find that in Galatians chapter 1, verses 10 to 28. He did not borrow anything from the apostles in Jerusalem because he didn't meet them again until three years later. When he returned to, uh, to Damascus, he began his witness afresh. And uh, verse 22, But Saul increased the more and strength and confound the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. And... After that, many days were fulfilled that the Jews took counsel to kill him. They, they didn't like what he was saying. They were getting upset by the message he was proclaiming. And this was the beginning of the persecutions, the suffering that he would face. Throughout his life, the apostle was hated. He was plotted against by both the Jew and the Gentile. And as we travel through Acts, we'll see how the opposition and the persecution increase ends up a prisoner in Rome, but he counted privilege. He wasn't upset that it took place. He counted a privilege to suffer for the sake of Christ. Number five, Saul meets the believers in Jerusalem. He meets the believers in Jerusalem. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, this is after he'd been let down by, uh, by the disciples in a basket from the wall there in Damascus. He come to Jerusalem. He is said to join himself to the disciples but they were afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. So there's two stages in Saul's experience with the church in Jerusalem. At first, he shows up. I, got, I again, kind of envisioned this in my mind this week as I was preparing for the message. He, he walks in and everyone's like, what? Who had to, do you know who that is? Uh, you know, they probably look for the biggest fella. I'm going to use his name, Bruno. Bruno, get him out of here. The biggest guy in the fellowship, get him out of the building. Like, we're not having him around here. He's a bad dude. I mean, sir, I wouldn't be one bit surprised if some of the people in the fellowship there had family members that Paul had had killed. Right? I mean, it's only three years. It's not that long. I mean, I know it's a few, but it's not that long. Maybe some of them had been put in prison by Paul or Saul himself, and they had gotten out. Now they see him again. It's like, no way am I going back there. Get that guy out of here. Uh, they were afraid of him. And they, were, and they thought this attitude of friendliness was only a trick, was a, a strategy, a tactic to get into the fellowship and find out all who's the believers and then come in and swoop him and take everyone up. They didn't believe that he was a disciple. Perhaps his disappearance, right? He, no one heard of him for three years. I'm sure... Some people heard about what happened to Damascus that traveled back, uh, but now he was gone for three years. Where had he been for three years? 
What were you, what were you doing? What was going on? Why had you waited so long? We, we heard that you were a Christian. Why wouldn't you come back to Jerusalem right away? Why did you go take off for three years? So lots of questions, and, and maybe in their minds, unanswered and created an atmosphere. When you're uncertain, when you don't know, are you always really happy? No. You, you, you don't like that. It causes anxiety, fear, suspicion. Have you ever traveled somewhere and uh, you didn't know exactly what was going on? So uh, a couple of years ago, I was in Holland, me and my daughter. And uh, Brother Stan Kemp bought us tickets to go into Amsterdam. He couldn't take us, but I've been there a couple of times, so I knew where not to go and where to, to go. So I got in there, and then uh, and he showed us how to use the ticket. I probably should have watched that a little better. He's on the way home. You, you scan it as you go out, and I scanned it the wrong way or too fast or something, and it wouldn't really open the door for me, and, and I was a little bit anxiety. I have a bit of anxiety, like, I don't want to get stuck over here. I can't speak Dutch. And I was like, I think I can push through that door because I already paid, and I pushed through the door and went. I just admitted a crime, okay? I did pay. But when you get anxious, when you don't have the answers, you don't know what's happening, you get afraid. And this was happening with these believers. They were afraid. That's why they wouldn't let them into fellowship. Verse 27, but Barnabas, that, that encouraging man shows up took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto him how he'd seen the Lord in the way and had spoken to him and how he preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So we see Saul rejected. Now we see Saul accepted. It was Barnabas who helped the church in Jerusalem before accept uh, Saul again, or helped them accept Saul, I should say. He took Saul in her wing. I have no doubt that they probably got together someplace. I don't think they got together for coffee at Timmy's back then or anything. But they got together, and they had a chat. He found out what took place. He goes, I believe you. Let's go, Saul. Let's go talk to them. And, I mean, he, he was encouraging. And, and he, he said, hey, this, he, he's, he, he is what he says he is. He had seen the risen Christ. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 talks about that. You know, Bar Barnabas, and this is probably what really happened or helped as well, he had no hidden agenda with befriending Saul. There was no benefit for Barnabas. This was just the nature of the man to encourage other believers, and he did just that. And then Saul begins, so they welcome into the fellowship, and then he begins to preach and speak boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ with the Grecians, the, the Hellenistic Jews. Those were the same ones who had engineered the trial and death of Stephen. He would have known many of them by name probably work with them after Stephen had been killed and say, hey, how can we uh, get rid of these Christians? He was one of them. He was born and raised in Tarshish. He was a Hellenistic Jew, a, a Grecian Jew, and, uh, but they wouldn't have none of that. No way. And they, but they went about to slay him. They, they plotted to kill him, and then we see the church leaders help him get to Caesarea and then on to Tarshish. We won't... Um, See Saul again until Acts chapter 11, the latter, or verse 25. And uh, when once more him and Barnabas uh, work together, they're ministering in Antioch, and that takes place seven years after this. So it's 10 years by Acts 11 that he'd been saved, and he's working in that part of the, the vineyard of, the, uh, of, the, of God's uh, church. He's headquartered there. He's reaching out to people. He's uh, seeing uh, the ministry, the Word of God be sent out to the Gentiles, and and those in the Roman Empire and regions of uh, Syria and, uh, and areas of that realm. And he's just busy doing, establishing churches. He's busy serving God. Busy serving God. Look at verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Hey, we, we've seen this another summary statement by Luke. Luke gives them occasionally throughout the Scripture. Here, it's at different places. Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. It's different. Soon the center would be Antioch, not Jerusalem. And the, the key leader would be Paul, not Peter. Now, Peter doesn't totally disappear for a while yet, but we see the transition. There's a time of peace for the church. It, the church isn't complacent, though. It doesn't sit on its laurels. It's, it you know, rests, it strengthens itself because storms are coming. Uh, and we see the door of faith has been opened to the Jews 
to the Samaritans, and to the Gentiles. You know, God has each of us here for a reason, a purpose, and for a season. Each and every one of us. He changes his workmen because no one lives forever, but his work goes on. Amen? It goes on and on and on. And you and I, in this season of our life, get to play a part in the work of the gospel. Don't shun it. Don't put it aside. Embrace it and declare the truth of the word of God. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you to please stand. The piano's going to play. Do you have any hopeless cases in your life? Are there some people in your life that you love and you're praying they get saved? Or maybe you're praying that they get back right with the Lord. A son, a daughter, husband, a wife, friend, a co-worker. Let me encourage you to keep praying for them. Keep lifting them up. Keep telling them the truth about Jesus. Keep living right before them. You don't know what God's doing in their hearts right now. They may not be here. They might be far away from you right now. But you don't know what God's doing in their hearts. Let me encourage you to bring them to the Lord yet once again. If God has been working in your heart, pricking your heart about salvation, come to Him. Don't push Him aside. You need Him. Be like Saul and accept the gift of salvation. Christian, keep serving the Lord. He has a great plan for us. We're here for a reason. He has a purpose for us. Let us embrace it and go forward with him. At this time, pray for that loved one. Pray for that one who's lost. Christian, let's make sure we're serving the Lord as we should. And if you don't know it, Christ is Savior. We would love to show you from the Word of God how to be saved. Dear Jesus, thank you for another time we've had to be in your word. Lord, I pray that there be any that know, know you as Savior, that they would follow the example of Saul and place their faith and trust in you. Lord, I know there's people here who've been praying for lost friends, family, members, loved ones. Help them. Encourage them to continue to pray. See that loved one get saved. It's difficult. It's hard. Encourage them to keep going, to serve you. And help us to have a heart to serve others as we see in the life of Saul. Later, Paul. Well, Lord, I pray you bless us, encourage us, help us have a great 11 o'clock service. Lord, thank you for all the goodness, you good things you've given to us this week. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Amen.